This is Pastor Peter Vitello. I want to thank you again for tuning in to another message. We've been looking at the life of Abraham, some of the scripture references that apply to uh, Abraham as a person, his faith. And today we're looking at a portion of scripture in Genesis 22. And I've titled this message, A Whole Heart for God. A Whole Heart for God for God. Let's pray. Father God, again, as only you can do, you make your word come alive to us. You have a way of getting to the core of who we are to help us to understand who we are. Only you, through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, can change us. And I ask you, Lord, to do that today. Change us through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been said that we, we serve a great God, but there are some that believe that they serve the make me feel good God. Believers throughout the ages have had a tendency to think of, of God as the, the make me feel good or make me feel great God. The make me feel great God that will make me feel great about myself or about my circumstances or uh, make me feel good about my, my job or the kids, or the, my wife, the neighbor, even our church. And this make me feel great God is compared to uh, the recreation director of a theme park or uh, maybe a cruise ship whose existence is to make sure everyone is having a great time and that we all feel good. But that's not the, the reality of the God that we serve. In fact, if you're following me on the outline, number one, faith matures. Faith matures through the experience of testing. And I even hate to make that statement, but this is the reality. This is the truth. Faith matures. Our faith matures. It grows. It's molded and shaped through the experiences of testing. And throughout Scripture, God tested his people. And we see this in Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 22. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. It says he tested him. He tried him. He proved him. The word is used in, in different senses. It does not always involve you know, evil purposes as an inducement of sin. But, but God was testing Abraham's heart. And this is horrendous. To think that God would want Abraham to offer the son that he waited 25 years for. The one that God said he would give to both him and Sarah. The one that he said the, the promise would be fulfilled. The covenant promises would be fulfilled through his son and through Isaac's son. And, and all of a sudden, here's God and he's saying, I want you to do this. I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain, I will tell you. The Lord will test his people to see if they will follow his instructions. And we see this throughout scripture. Exodus 16, 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what, what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. We see that again in Exodus 15, then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. And there the Lord made a decree and a law for them. And there he tested them. He tested them. And in fact, the Lord will test and humble his people to see what is within their hearts. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 5, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. 
Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. He tests to see what's in his people's hearts. The Lord will test and prove his people in order to protect them from pride. Deuteronomy 8, chapter 15 through 18, it says, He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you that it would that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. So th there's times he tests his people to prove his people in order to protect them from pride. And then the Lord will test and humble his people by preparing them even for warfare. For warfare. In the Old Testament, it was physical warfare. Judges chapter 3. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites, uh, living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamlet. They were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their forefathers through Moses. Now, this occurs 171 times, the word war, and it pertains to God's role in Israel's wars. When God calls Israel to arms against an enemy, it is because of the enemy's moral degradation. In such conflicts, it is the Lord who, who does battle on Israel's behalf. But nevertheless, the Israelites must also join the battle and fight with the Lord. Even though their land had been deeded to them as an inheritance, they must conquer it in battle. Now, what's crazy, I know this sounds confusion, uh, confusing in this portion of Scripture because Jesus teaches us to love our enemies, to pray for them, to feed them, to forgive them, not to go to war with them. As New Testament believers, we're not just fighting, though, a physical battle. We are fighting a spiritual battle. And there's times the Lord tests us. There's times that he leaves giants in the land, so to speak. Some circumstances in our own lives that will cause us to do battle in the heavenlies. Spiritual battle. We know this is true because Paul, in his letter to the Church at Ephesus says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, and this is the New Living Translation paraphrase by this says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. But here's the Lord, and he's testing Abraham to see what's in his heart, to see if he's got a whole heart for God. Number two, faith matures through the exercise of obedience. So just picture Abraham out in, the, out in the desert wrestling all night long with God. Questioning, did I hear you right, Lord? Is this what you want me to do? And you can see him, him just agonizing over this commandment. This test. But yet his obedience was amazing. It says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took, him, took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. So obviously the Lord spoke to him probably during the night while he was agonizing over this whole crazy scenario. 
And yet he's acting in obedience. Here it is the next day. God's testing of Abraham was intended to prove his obedience and his faith and to confirm and strengthen him by this trial and to furnish in him an example of perfect obedience for all ages. For all of us who look back at this and say, wow, how could he go through with this? You see, letter A, Abraham's obedience drove him to make preparations to follow through. He didn't sit back, he didn't contemplate, he didn't wait. The very next day, early the next morning, he puts everything together and by faith, he is stepping out in obedience to God's commands. There was no debate about details. With the limited instructions from the Lord, he rose early the next morning and he prepared. He prepared the transportation. He cut the wood. He sharpened the knife. He prepared the fire. He prepared the food and the water because it was a three-day trip. And he made sure that the preparations were done in order to be able to successfully carry out the instructions of the Lord. There was no delayed response on Abraham's part. And you think about this, and he's traveling, and then he's got to spend the, the night camping with his son. Knowing what he's got to do. I can't even begin to understand how agonizing that must have been. Three days traveling with your son. Number three, faith matures through the execution of trust. It matures through the exercise of obedience. It matures through the experience of testing. And here we see it matures through the execution of trust. On the third day, it says, Abraham, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. That's a statement of faith. We will come back to you, not me, we. And then in verse six, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. I don't know about you, this is amazing faith. This is amazing trust. And he's not spilling the beans. He's not telling his son, uh, you're the sacrifice. I believe he's believing God's going to provide. But I want you to see something here. He laid the wood on Isaac. Isaac is such a type of Jesus Christ. He's going to be a sacrifice. He's going to be, as you see, a willing sacrifice. He carried the wood as Christ carried the cross. For three days, father and son traveled together. Abraham, like Jesus, had his face set towards Jerusalem. He was determined to follow through by executing trust. This is clearly shown in the conversations which took place during the journey. We will worship and then we will come back and God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Only Abraham knew the significance of what he was saying. He was promising that the youngster who was about to die would also return with him. Letter A, Abraham was living out the word of God. It is evident that for him, there was no such thing as partial obedience. He was carrying through with everything. It's amazing how we have partial obedience. And you know, as you're listening, you know where that partial obedience is in your own life. You know how that's lived out. We're told to love our neighbor. Do we love everyone? Do we pick and choose who we love? Do we just put up with some people while we love those that are easy to love, but inwardly we despise those that are difficult? Isn't that partial obedience? 
And we can go down the list in the things that we do or the things that we think. Are, are we plagued with partial obedience? Not Abraham. His faith was maturing. Hebrews 11, 17, 19, the author of Hebrews says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, a type of Christ. His one and only son through Sarah. Even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Amazing. It's been said that the promise of God required that Isaac should live while the command of God demanded that he should die. Again, the promise of God required that Isaac should live while the command of God demanded that he should die. Abraham was suddenly confronted with, with that most awesome of problems, a self-contradictory God. Unbelief stumbles over such problems, while mature faith waits to see how the distant recesses of the wisdom of God, hidden from human reason and understanding, will be made known. But the waiting can be excruciating, and many people, rather than bear the pain, simply abandon the faith. Number four, faith matures through the energy of perseverance. Through the, en the energy of perseverance. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, Abraham is old. He's over 100 years old. His son Isaac... We're not sure exactly how old he was, probably 16, 17, 18 years old. Either way, he was strong enough where he could have either fought dad off or run away. But he willingly sac was willing to sacrifice his life. This was an incredible trial. And we're told when we go through trials... Book of James, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is pretty hard to do at times, though. Very difficult to do at times. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith operates in the tensions of life and often demonstrates itself more fully by its responses to the furnace of affliction than the warm, shallow waters of ease and prosperity. Let me say that again. Faith operates in the tensions of life and often demonstrates itself more fully by its responses to the furnace of affliction than the warm, shallow waters of ease and prosperity. Brings us to our next point, letter A. For faith to become obvious, it has to operate. It has to operate. The Lord was providing Abraham with one of the most profound platforms upon which his faith could not only be strengthened, but also displayed. The human emotions of this exam that Abraham had to take were extreme. Abraham's natural paternal love of a father was probably more intense than most fathers because of how Isaac had been promised, how he had been born, and, and miraculously presented with the promise of God. Abraham was being asked to evaluate his faith in terms of his natural affections. The social aspects of the case could not be disregarded. If Abraham became known as the man who, in his own age, had callously murdered his own son and had given peculiar religious reasons for doing such a thing, it would be reasonable to assume that he would have been regarded by his household, his contemporaries, and the rest of history as some kind of freak. So he's got to trust that God's got something totally different in mind. Which brings us to point five. Faith matures through the empowerment of resolution through the empowerment of resolution. 
Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. At this point, he's fully given over to the command of God. At this point, I think I believe that the writer of Hebrews is hitting the nail on the head when he said that Abraham reasoned in his heart that God could raise the dead and would give Isaac, bring him back to life. So he reaches out his hand and he takes the knife and he, just at the point where he's going to thrust the knife. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What was God looking for in this test? He was looking for Abraham's heart. He was looking for Abraham's whole heart. He was making sure that nothing, no one, would dethrone God from being number one in his heart. And Abraham, in this act, was proving that he loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He stood over that boy with knife raised, with heartbreaking. And when his faith was stretched to unspeakable limits, God spoke. Abraham's faith was relentlessly locked into the premise that God was faithful and that he had promised to do certain things. James says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. What did he do? He just offered himself to God in the process. He was dying to self. He loved his son. His son was the apple of his eye. But he was willing to say, no, Lord, there's nothing that's going to separate my love from you. You have all my heart. Does God have all of our hearts? Does he have everything about you? Is there a person or a place or a thing that dethrones God from being number one in your life? Letter A, in the divine timing of the test of God, your true heart is revealed. In the divine timing of, of the test of God, your true heart is revealed. Just like Abraham, there comes that season in our journey where we've been taken to that spiritual place of testing so that no, not only God sees what's in our heart, we see what's in our heart. I've had moments where I have seen what is in my heart and it's ugly. There are moments where my faith has been tested and I have fallen short, miserably short. What about you? And yet I know I have to cling to the verse that says that he'll complete the work that he started within us. I've got to trust that he'll do that because there are times where my faith is strong and there are times where my faith is weak. But God puts us through tests not only to see what's in our heart, but to reveal to us so that we can see what's in our heart. Psalm 131, the New Living Translation says, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with the matters too great or awesome for me, but I have stilled and quiet myself just as a small child is quiet with its mother. Yes, like a small child is my soul within me. Is that true of you? We need to press on, even when we don't always know why. Even when we don't understand the situation, the where or the when. But always knowing who we serve. There will be times when God will stretch us to the limits of our physical, emotional, social, intellectual, and spiritual being. And are we willing to go through that in obedience? 
The stretching will serve to expand our capacity to know him. And in that knowing, we get to discover the vast potential of a life that is lived by faith. But are we willing to go through things that we can't comprehend, things that we can't understand, things that stretch us to our spiritual limit? And can we trust him in the midst of what we go through? There was a couple who used to go to England to shop in the beautiful stores. They both like antiques and pottery, especially teacups. There was their, it was their 25th wedding anniversary. One day in this beautiful shop, they saw a beautiful teacup. And they said, may we see that? We'd never seen one quite so beautiful. As the lady handed it to them, suddenly the teacup spoke. You don't understand, it said. I haven't always been a teacup. There was a time when I was red and I was clay. My master took me and rolled me and patted me over and over. And I yelled out, let me alone. But he only smiled, not yet. Then I was placed on a spinning wheel, and the teacup said. And suddenly I was spun around and around and around. Stop it, I'm getting dizzy, I screamed. But the master only nodded and said, not yet. Then he put me in the oven. I never felt such heat. I wondered why he wanted to burn me. And I yelled and I knocked at the door. I could see him through the opening and I could read his lips as he shook his head. Not yet. Finally, the door opened and he put me on the shelf and I began to cool. There, that's better, I said. And then he brushed and painted me all over. The fumes were horrible. I thought I would gag. Stop it, stop it, I cried. He only nodded. Not yet. Then suddenly he put me back in the oven. Not like the first one. This was twice as hot. And I knew I would suffocate. I begged. I pleaded. I screamed. I cried all the time. I could see him through the opening, nodding his head and saying, not yet. Then I knew there wasn't any hope. I would never make it. I was ready to give up. But the door opened and he took me out and placed me on the shelf. One hour later, he handed me a mirror and said, look at yourself. And I did. I said, that's not me, that couldn't be me. It's beautiful, I'm beautiful. I won't remember then, he said. I know it hurts to be rolled and padded, but if I had left you alone, you'd have dried up. I know it made you dizzy to spin round on the wheel, but if I had stopped, you would have crumbled. I know it hurts and was hot and disagreeable in the oven, but if I hadn't put you there, you would have cracked. I know the fumes were bad when I brushed and painted you all over, but if I hadn't done that, you never would have hardened. You would not have any color in your life. And if I hadn't put you back in that second time in the oven, you wouldn't survive for very long because the hardness would not have held. Now you are a finished product. You are what I had in mind when I first began with you. We're in a process of being made into beautiful creatures that worship an incredible God. You see, number four, faith matures through the exactness of God's provision. Through the exactness of God's provision. At the right time, at the moment of complete surrender and dying to self, it says, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. See letter A, in the test of the divine provision of God, your faith will be rewarded. There in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horn. The impact was of God's provision. It was so great that Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And number seven, faith matures through the existence of divine communication. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. 
Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Faith matures through the existence of divine communication. And then in a test of the divine communication of God, your faith will increase. Having gained Abraham's whole heart, the Lord took the opportunity to point out once again that his plans and purposes had not changed. And why did those plans and purposes not change? Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, because you have obeyed me. Psalm 119.2 says, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. That is what God is after. He wants all of us, not just little pieces of us, not this little room in our heart, not this little chamber in our heart. He wants everything, even that place that, that you keep locked up that nobody else gets in but you. God's already been in that room. You can't lock it up and hide it from him. He's already been in there. But you need to surrender it. You need to surrender. I need to surrender. We need to surrender to God. And sometimes that takes a real dying to self, a true repentance. This was given to me years ago. It's a letter. It says, to my child, my treasured possession, my ways are not your ways. Once again, I am leading you down a path you would have shunned if you were to be given the opportunity. And why? Because I lead you along the road of self-denial, self-sacrifice, and perseverance. This road is not a thoroughfare, nor is it a way generally known even among seasoned travelers. Today, I want you to see purpose as I see purpose. In my kingdom, significance is the outcome of being sent. Your work in life is not in vain. What you call a waste of time on this journey, I call part of the plan. You would not understand the reason behind it, even if I were to explain it, until you have walked through it. Believe me, there is no other choice, but you will be glad soon. I promise, with all my love, your Heavenly Father. Psalm 131, Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or awesome for me, but I have stilled and quiet myself just as a small child is quiet with its mother. Yes, like a small child is my soul within me. Oh, that we would learn to quiet our, our lives before the Lord, that we would learn to give him our whole heart. Because when we don't, when he does not have our whole heart, then our heart is proud. It's the pride that keeps us from fully surrendering. My prayer is that we would learn that in every time, every day, every circumstance, that we would fully, fully serve the Lord with a whole heart. May God bless you.